If I'm on the city council, if I'm a resident, I'm just thinking I have one of most, my most valuable assets that's underperforming right now. And it's in a vital position between the waterfront next to the Forest City site, close to Main Street, so there's a historic downtown. Um, I think I read all of what Barbara wrote on the historic area of the downtown buildings, and I love it. How do you, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a thing that we're coming across in everything from North Adams and Mass Mocha to Beacon and Dia Beacon, is how does a performing arts center activate a historic downtown, and how do you gain both a local use and a, and a um, financial tourist use? Um, so, um, just quickly, I think everyone's familiar with this photo. It's the armory back in better days. Um, and just to remind everyone what it looks like in its current condition. Um, and I'm sure, I'm not sure if a lot of you have been inside. We were fortunate to be able to um, take a tour through the inside. So it's, um, it, it needs some help. Um, so now we go to the question, why a performing arts center in New Rochelle? So um, it, Maurice uh, actually shared uh, this quote with us, um, a strong business community cannot exist without the arts. So we, we as a team um, also share your vision of creating um, a vibrant arts community within New Rochelle. Um, there's already um, the new Rochelle Opera, which you know has been um, kind of identified as being one of um, one of the primary uh, kind of users of this facility. And we know that there will be more. We know that having a facility like this would foster um, a lot more arts to to uh, happen within New Rochelle. Um, so, what? Yeah, go ahead. I, and that's one thing I think, even in the state that it currently is, uh, we have 14,000 kids came out there for Halloween night. For the, so if you're going to get 14,000 people coming out in the state that's in now, imagine what you could do if you really turned it into something. <laughs> um, so I think that keeping that in mind, um, one benefit, again, a benefit not you know, for the city, for the government, for the people itself, what are the benefits of this site? And I think uh, one of them is restoring the historic character of the armory itself. One of them is we're providing a space uh, that can be used for multi-flexible uses, not just a single use, uh, but multiple uses. Okay. Um, actually, Todd, I might ask you to read the bullet points because okay. I have my glasses on. Okay. Uh, for those who can't read, so I think the first point is, is meeting the mission. So I think uh, I'm, I'm a, actually a lawyer as well by training. So you have to follow the mission of the lease. And the mission of the lease uh, 97 was that it's for a public purpose. I could be wrong on that, but I think that was something I learned and that's something to think about. Uh, the second thing is the historical significance of this has to be part of the bones of the new program that goes into it. And that has to be adapted but respected. Um, so now we talk about, we're going small, micro to macro, macro more now for the waterfront itself. I think you know, we, we know the Echo Bay redevelopment plan very well. We had to come in with program that's consistent with that. How could that fit into it? And I think the point here to make that we've learned and I've heard tonight even, is there's a lot of concern about what's gonna happen next door. And maybe you wait for Forest City to do a map, big, big development and then this site can find its own identity. Or you take, put the ball ahead of the game and you say, okay, we're gonna actually put a destination, um, iconic place right here that defines the identity here, connects it to downtown, and Forest City will follow. And I think that really hit me because um, we learned one thing in the trade is that developers don't wanna be the first on the block. They don't take the risk, but they'll be the second or the third. And we know they've been a little busy on other projects. And I, I think that if, this site was really developed as a commitment by the community into something that was special. I think it could actually help uh, the development of the uh, surrounding areas. Um, and, and just to go over the bullet points, because we did spend some time thinking through these. Uh, it, the use of the site and the reclamation of the site is consistent with the goals of the, uh, the Echo Bay redevelopment, although it might not have actually explicitly said what was going to happen to the armory, but we think that by following through the plan of just revitalizing the site creates other opportunities, um, as Todd explained. 
um, that maybe were not addressed in the Echo Bay plan? And the key is just to access the waterfront. And how could that, the landscaping, and how could the site itself allow people to access the waterfront? Um, and then also, as a, an extension of the downtown, it creates a destination towards um, the end of the downtown that, that could create uh, more tourism to New Rochelle and uh, also provide usable public space to the community that's not um, available through other performing arts centers that, are, that might be within 15 or 20 miles of here. And in, uh, in talking to HR and A too, who did the study for the city as well, and, and something we believe in is you have to activate the streetscape, is what we call it. So as you go by, as you move through towards Main Street, as you enter New Rochelle, is the street front activated? Does it draw you in? Does it uh, allow you to connect to then what would be the next? And so this site really needs to have an activated streetscape. How will this space serve the community? We've, we've all talked about a performing arts center. Um, in this location, but there are other uses that would also be paired into that that we wanted to point out. Um, and, and these uses all together make a vital program for the site. It makes it, um, it, makes it a viable business-wise and also just the energy of, of people coming to the site and using it within the community. So obviously there's a performing arts center, there's also um, a veterans community center that's, that's been allotted space. Um, we have an event space that is kind of an open, flexible space. Uh, we, I was speaking with Jim previously, and you know, he was. We were talking about disaster relief and, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, this is a space that could be rented out for for functions if people are having cocktail parties, but it could also be, it, you know, for emergencies if if we need to house people in in times or of emergencies. Or or <laughs> 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 um, it it can provide public waterfront access. It provides open space for the community and also um, restaurants. So any one of these would not be viable business wise or maybe even community wise, but a flexible, mixed, diverse use is an option that is what everybody would. So why would this be successful? And I think that's kind of the question that, that the group has been tasked with answering. So trying to peel back the layers of the onion to, to get to this point. So we went back to the HR and a study and we identified four points that they, they had said would make a successful business for this site. Performing arts or not, these are things that we needed to meet. We needed a clearly defined program with no more than two complementary uses meeting the needs and demands of the community, addresses the Echo Bay waterfront and taps into its financial benefits, accommodates the veterans of New Rochelle and their spatial needs. Um, we also looked at several local uh, case studies, so other performing arts centers that are nearby. Um, we looked at the number of seats, the number of dates they were booked, um, we were looked at their we looked at their locations. Wherever we could, we looked at their financials as well. So you know, there's White Plains, there's Irvington. Um, there's a lot of them here, and, and they don't have to be all examples of success stories. You can learn a lot of the uh, lessons from those maybe who have not performed well. Was it too many seats? Is there not a restaurant in it? Other reasons. So we really studied all of one of these. So both guys, you got to you know, study these to learn examples of what works. But then also, what is the comparative advantage? Why would people come here over other places? Now, the capital doesn't book a lot of, I think it's only about 45 nights a year right now, and it does have a lot more seats, and so it runs primarily as that type of a venue with those kind of ticket sales. But I think a performing arts center here in New Rochelle wouldn't be driven on ticket sales, and we'll show that financially later. And, and also, I believe this is, just double check my price here. Um, yeah, the, the Capitol Theater actually has more than three times the amount of seats, so it would be attracting a different type of event as well. Yep, concerts and stuff like that. Um, um, so, what gives us the competitive advantage? So, what makes this viable? So, we already talked about the program and how all those things work together, but we, we identified five points that um, we wanted to study for our business plan. Um, one is that we have a state-of-the-art facilities that's going to foster the, um, the 
the arts community with the New Rochelle. It will be home to the New Rochelle Opera. Um, there will be the community amenities that we already mentioned, the on-site dining, waterfront access, outdoor open space for organized events. These are all things that other performing arts centers do not have. Um, so we do think that this would make our site more attractive. Um, there would be uh, high profile designers. Um, the location also, you have the advantage that you're pulling from local pop populations and potentially also from uh, New York City as well. Um, and the most important thing is that there's an economically mutual supportive programming. So the, the programming cannot exist alone and they work together to fund each other. Yeah, and I think um, as you know, peak season, summertime is, is kind of the no brainer. It's how do you do it in the off season? And that's some of the numbers we looked at. I think the, you know, the location is pretty valuable both with an identity for New Rochelle on building off some of the history with studio and theater and the arts. I mean, uh, from, the, from the founding of New Rochelle, I mean, the whole art movement, and also the access to New York. I mean, just like we did tonight, to jump on a train and get here in 20, 30 minutes is something you could do in a night. I mean, I go up to Dia Beacon sometimes for the half day, and that's an hour and 10 minutes um, without driving a car. You know, 70% of Manhattan still doesn't have a car. So I, I think that you can hit both the local and the summer and then you can also pull a little bit more and easier geographically and, and accessibility from the city. Uh, and that's just for the one use of performing arts. Um, so what's the plan? We set out, when we, when we started to think about the design of the space, we set out some design criteria for ourselves. We wanted to retain the historic architecture as much as possible. We didn't want to go in and add crazy additions and kind of put a, a design stamp all over it. We really wanted to retain as much of the um, architecture as possible. We wanted to retain the street, street view, so we want to maintain what it currently looks like, but we wanted to activate it a little bit more. We wanted to enhance and give it more of a presence from the street. It's a curb appeal, if you will. We wanted to also create uh, a gateway to the waterfront, and we wanted to activate and connect to the urban fabric. Uh, so these are tougher to read, but I think the program is the existing building has 36,000 square feet. And the idea is to not add any new space, but to use the space in a program way that would add to all these different uses. So instead of just having a single use, and we have the performing arts, which is about half of that space, then a 200 seat restaurant, a 250 seat or person event space that's 5,000 square feet of the back that opens up to the landscaping and to the waterfront. And then we actually have uh, more parking than is required. There's up to 315 parking spaces. We'll get to it quick. Um, this is the uh, circulation for individuals. So you could access from Main Street all the way to the waterfront through this part of the site. Um, I don't know, do you want to mention anything else on that? Um, we have a continuous access for the, for the public. That's the, the big red arrow. And then we have a secondary um, access point through the building um, for the users of the building, visitors of the building, that they would be able to actually go right directly through the, the site is, onto uh, the green space. The open space and green space that has uh, multiple uses. I think this is an important one if I was a city official or if I drove around town, is the key is the moving all traffic off the site. So we meet all the needs that you have to have. This is usually for me and a lot of community uh, discussions, the number one issue is traffic. So you want to relieve all pressure from Main Street. So you do that by having loading, drop-off, valet, and parking all off of Main Street onto the site itself. And you have no backup onto Main Street. And again, as I mentioned, 315 parking spaces is about one for every three uh, seats that you have into the arena. Uh, uh, to, the to the theater and the restaurant and the event space. Uh, so if they were all simultaneously occupied, you would be able to provide enough parking for all of them. I know the central parking area in the city is just a few blocks away, and that's a one to five ratio. If you actually went with, I'll show you later, 200 parking uh, spaces, you'd save $4 million on the construction. So and I also parking drives the cost, actually. Parking is, is definitely, when we get to the cost, we can point out um, to show you that. We, we did look at actually doing subterranean parking. It's structurally very complicated and very costly. It was prohibitively expensive. We are looking at doing um, an above-ground parking garage. It would be 
roughly three stories. And what we would do, similar to the success that we've had in our other projects, we would actually turf the roof, which means we would create a, a big, beautiful landscaped lawn that would be over the roof. And you can kind of see, um, those of you familiar with reading architectural drawings, there's uh, the site plan showing the connection between um, the armory itself and the garage, it's all, it's all green because the roof would be all green. But you can see the land actually slips up in the section above where we would actually create almost like a berm that would hide the back of the parking garage from the armory. So you would pre preserve the, the nature of, of the space um, so you wouldn't be looking at an ugly parking garage. Uh, but you would also gain all of that open space, so you would maintain the full lot for uh, pedestrian or for visitor use. So the, I don't want to get in the way here, but this uh, space in the back is 5,000 square feet that could be used for lots of public facilities. Daytime, nighttime. Daytime could be classes for kids, could be veterans meetings, whatever. Nighttime could be events. You could have weddings. You have cocktail parties, you have corporate parties. Uh, but the idea is you're not just giving them 5,000 square feet indoors, you're getting the entire walkability all the way to the waterfront on top of the parking. In fact, the uh, nine subways hit at the arena in Brooklyn. And what we did is created a live roof on the back of the facility where when you come up from the subway, you have the uh, entire pavilion there, and it's all a live roof on the back. So it's, it's something we've done quite a bit. Uh, what, was, what will it cost? Um, and again, on this issue, we, we did a lot of assumptions and we also tried to be incredibly conservative in making it be as expensive as it would need to be and knowing that we wouldn't uh, overpromise and underperform. So that said, we worked with Richard on this. And um, for construction, and Richard, jump in at any moment if you want to or anything, we can come back to this. Uh, the total is around $24 million. Uh, that includes performing arts center, restaurant, the landscaping, the veterans, the above ground parking, professional cost and um, all on a 36,000 square foot unit, plus of all the extra space. And this did not include, what was interesting to find, is either the reduction in parking that could come, which would save a large portion, or some in-kind contributions by uh, some other people that know some kind of security that could provide some facilities and some usage on that. Uh, if there's questions on this, Richard can come back up, or if you want to add anything right now on this. No, I mean, we, we base a lot of this on our experience in these different types of venues in the sense of all the completion costs. Uh, took into consideration the uh, parking, which as you can see is a significant portion of the, of the project. It's an unfortunate reality that, that we have to be faced with. But um, you know, we feel very confident with these numbers based on the information we have that uh, this is a very feasible project to be to be done. Yeah, so parking is a third of the cost. So working around the required parking and how you're designing the parking is a significant factor uh, in that. But again, if you look at across the uh, country, in armory renovation or even performing arts centers on price per square foot, this is fairly reasonable. But how do you pay for that? Obviously through some ability of uh, having the 501c3 and having a community backing, a lot of interested parties that are both um, coming from several baskets, from private fundraising to corporate fundraising. Um, to sponsorships, to writing grants, which you can do. Um, the, the, I think it's very feasible. This actually may seem like a lot uh, for projects like this right now, but as far as projects we worked on and been involved in, this is not a big lift. And if you take a, a, a good design, you take a strong team, you create quite a buzz. I think so. So can you pay for this? Uh, you know, if you can pay to get it built, can you operate it? So I think this is a really important issue. Obviously, this has to be defined further too, but. If you look at Justice Performing Arts Center, it would actually underperform. Um, on a lot of studies that we did, the Performing Arts Center, let's say, ran at about a hundred million, I mean a half a million dollars a year in income, but with expenses of a million dollars a year. So that's you're gonna be at a loss of around four hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. But if you add in a restaurant and other uses like that, you could basically come up with a restaurant which would just be rented out and leased to an operator. So you don't have to do the heavy lifting of operating it. That could bring you in about $300,000 a year. You'd almost break even. So what uh, this entire facility would drive off is a lot of the event space. Because event space is low cost maintenance and high return on, on the profit. So there's a lot of assumptions that I could walk through real quick on each of these. But basically, we figured within year one, you could actually turn a profit if you had the multiple uses. And this was highly vetted through Nature and other, other national studies. Uh, so just real quick, for example, 
Um, on the Performing Arts Center, like I mentioned, um, we even are assuming right here that at the end of the year, you'd have a loss of at least $240,000 on it. But that, that, that's assumable and OK. Um, now, this could be met up, of course, at times, too, by a lot of memberships, donations. As a 501c3, you can try to, try to meet up that. But we're being very realistic on that. Uh, you could basically get through, we assume 500 seats at 140 events a year. So that was a basic assumption, and the variables could go and change because of that. And there'd be some small for concessions that could come in. And I mentioned the event space. So we, we divided it down, and not, not for you right now, but there's peak, regular, and off-peak. The 52 weeks divided into that. If you look in, we're still averaging conservatively 1.5 to 2.5 nights a week. So it could be one event a week, up to two and a half to three events a week. Overall, in a 52 week year, maybe two events a week is all you would need at a driver, including coverage and costs and everything, of making almost $800,000 a year. There's a lot of reasons why people do event business. Uh, you can make a lot of money in that from weddings to cocktail parties to everything else. <coughs> In the end then, on the restaurant, I, I said the, the recommendation would be to not operate and manage it, but to lease it out. You get the $285,000 a year without running it. And basically that would take in uh, the daytime uses, six days a week, as well as nighttime. And that's just assuming 50% utilization for lunch, 75 for dinner, and only at 12 and $18 per person. So not including even a lot of the alcohol. So again, try to stay very conservative and still coming out with about $200,000 a year after salaries. And we took all that from the Deloitte Tooch numbers and everything like that. Again, on the first study, just looking at that, multiple uses, flexible times, off-peak, on-peak, daytime, nighttime, weekend, weekdays. How do you make use of all of this space for all those uses that can balance each other is really the math. Um, so I think that just the conclusion of what we've said of the, the capital cost to build it, which is a lift from the community, but I think that's been proven and can happen. Uh, revenue could happen in day one, and there's a lot of options how to mortgage that. I mean, you do have uh, a property here which can have value and be mortgaged at some point, too, if you need to not lift off the ground and not just a private contribution. And then the annual and operating, as we said, year one funds. Um, the key is you'll have a professional board. You'll have a management and operator of both the restaurant and of the uh, Performing Arts Center, and I know there's already been a lot of talk with people like Michael Strong from Tiffin and other people who would be very excited to come to New Rochelle. And you'd have the Performing Arts Center operating at a small loss, but made up through contributions, <coughs> memberships, by event space, by restaurant rent. Uh, then, uh, of course, we've kind of held you out for way too long to even know well, what it even look like. And uh, Krista could walk you through that real quick. So our vision for the for the, the revitalization of the armory, as we said before, is to not change the, the architecture of the space. We want to keep the historic architecture. It is architecturally a, a very unique structure. Um, there are not many armories with this type of barrel, barrel vault. Um, so we want to celebrate that. We want to bring the, the front of the building uh, back to its glory and allow it to be used by the community. So you can see we, we've kind of had an artistic rendering here of, of what it might be like to um, almost create a, a, a park in the front. We, we would assume that we would want a memorial garden in the front for the, for the veterans. That, um, through talking to Ron and Maurice, this was something that they, they felt very strongly about and we feel as though it's something that would go very well with our vision for the front of the space. Um, just actually go back one more. Um, and uh, kind of on, over on the left, we have uh, picnic tables. They could be um, just different ways to occupy that front of that space. It, it could be tied to the restaurant. It could just be community um, tables for people to come and sit. Uh, what, uh, just a, an artistic rendering of what we imagine the event space to look like. Um, this is the back of the armory. It kind of looks out onto uh, the green space. We would have a bit of hardscape kind of right outside the doors. Um, you can kind of see on the right hand side, it actually occupies underneath the performing arts um, theater. Uh, so it kind of makes double use of the space. So we kind of are stacking our program, very efficient. Um, and then a view of the theater itself. Up from the ground. 
were on the floor. Uh, sorry for keeping you for an hour. Uh, and I know there's some questions that are probably important. I think we just want to end by saying thank you extremely, you know, very much. And, and I think for hopefully for a new Rochelle or for a lot of people here, this is just the beginning. Uh, these are just early ideas and this would be the start of anything new. And, and sometimes projects for us happen shortly and sometimes they take seven to ten years, but those are the best ones. So uh, it's just a great honor to be here today and talk to you and, and meet you. And, and we're open to answer any questions and help out in any way you need uh, to make, your, make this possible.